So we're going to go to our next speaker now, who's based in New York. It's Elena Kanagi Lu, who, hello, good morning, Elena. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, just a little bit about you. You've lived um, between the US and Tokyo, which I think has been a big inspiration in your life. But you also studied textile design at FIT, which is my old school. And since 2015, after you studied lace making in Europe, you've been working and, and studying lace quite a lot. So we're very excited to hear about your talk today to teach us about bobbin lace making and, um, and to learn also about your lace guild that you started in Brooklyn. So thank you for, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. So I will start by, of course, sharing my screen. Hopefully this should work just fine. Oh, that's the wrong screen. Here it is. Okay. So I will start presenting. All right. Um, my internet is a tiny bit slow. Hopefully that won't impact things too much. So bear with me. Okay. So first of all, again, I really appreciate, thank you so much to Priti and Philip and Lee to have it, for having me here today. It's really an honor to be among such wonderful speakers. Um, and I just want to start um, kind of with a little story about one of my lace mentors, um, Tessie Schoenholzer, who I studied lace identification with on a trip around Europe to study lace making in 2015. I took lace identification workshop um, with her at the Fondazione Licio in Florence. And um, I came into this workshop thinking, I can identify lace pretty well. I'm, I, know, I know lace, I know bobbin and needle lace well. Um, but when I left, I felt like I had, my universe had been exploded and I was like a tiny grain of sand in the whole ocean. Um, today, I feel like maybe a handful of sand, so I'm building. But um, she used to look at the lace with me and say, Elena, the lace tells a story. Look at the lace. You can see, you know, look here. This is where the lace maker was happy. This is where the lace maker was sad. And at the time, I had no idea what she was talking about. Um, and, but she, she insisted that I look for the story. Um, and in the years since, I've discovered that in looking at lace for so long and thinking about lace for so long that now I can see it myself. Um, so today I'm going to share with you just a few of the many stories that lace can tell us. I will discuss how the five centuries old technique of lace making long overshadowed by machine imitations is still valuable and relevant today. What can lace making teach us about connecting our bodies and our minds? How is lace history relevant to pressing current conversations about uh, capitalism, colonialism, and sustainability in fashion and beyond. Um, so I always start my lectures with the same question, which is what is lace? And that may sound like a very simple question, but lace is really an umbrella term for a variety of regional styles with very different technical um, production methods. So everything from bobbin lace and needle lace, which I'll be focusing on, but also to you know, different weaving techniques tatting, crochet, et cetera, et cetera, knotting. There are many methods of making lace, but what they have in common is that they share the aesthetic trait of having the pattern defined by the spaces between the threads. Um, so I have these slides to compare sort of on the right, the image that a lot of people have of lace, which is this sort of like frothy tool ground Chantilly lace. And then on the left, one of my very favorite pieces of lace in the world, which is a five foot long panel of Punto Anadia needle lace in the collection of the Met Museum where I work, depicting the story of Judith and Holofernes in 13 panels. So it's kind of like a lace comic strip. Um, and here you see, of course, the pinnacle moment where um, Judith is decapitating Holofernes. And the reason that I like to share this is because it looks so different aesthetically than the lace that people are sort of used to seeing today. So I think it's a great example to start with. Um, as well as my favorite quote by Thomas Fuller, a 17th century English author and churchman who elegantly put it, lace is just a little thread discanted on by art and industries. And unlike many of his religious contemporaries who denounced lace as a frivolous and even grotesque display of vanity, Fuller appreciated both the beauty and skill of lace, writing, let it not be condemned for a superfluous wearing because it does, not, it does neither hide nor heat the body seeing it doth adorn. 
So how did lace develop and where? So I will start with bobbin lace, um, which is my per personal specialization. Um, and the two primary methods, as I said, that I'll be focusing on today are bobbin and needle lace, the former of which is my specialty. Um, both techniques are often believed to have likely developed in Northern Italy, perhaps specifically in Venice in the first decades of the 16th century. And bobbin lace is essentially, um, it developed out of multi-strand braiding techniques which became cre increasingly complicated as more threads were introduced um, and it finally necessitated winding the individual threads around wooden or bone bobbins to keep them organized. Hence the name bone lace in English often is used as well or bobbin lace. Um, the threads are then crossed and twisted to create patterns following the diagram below. So I'll show you a, a short video of this later on so you can see this work in action, but it's essentially fancy braiding or cursive braiding as one of my students put it, which I love. So then we have, of course, needle lace, which developed, although simultaneously out of very different technical background, which is embroidery, um, specifically cut work and drawn work embroidery, wherein you start with a woven linen base, you trace your pattern um, onto the fabric and you um, cut out the areas of the design and then work back in the voided areas with buttonhole stitches to create a pattern. So you can see this in process um, on the upper right here, as well as lace being made after they finally abandoned the fabric base and started making needle lace directly on the parchment pattern, which you see below is my teacher, um, Marisa from Burano. Um, and this technique, this abandonment of the base fabric, they, the Italians refer to as punto in aria or stitches in air because you're literally working buttonhole stitches onto a parchment base rather than onto a fabric. Um, so, all right. So the development of lace also coincided with the recent introduction of printed pattern books in Europe. And although multiple earlier books, including needle lace and embroidery patterns exist from earlier in the 16th century, the earliest known bobbin lace pattern book is Le Pompe, Opera Nova, the first of which was published in Venice in 1557. Um, there has been extensive research into the widespread circulation and use of pattern books during this period and their availability across Western Europe. Um, and the next, then you see that um, a page from Le Pompe is on the right here with an example of a similar kind of braided lace. You can see the braiding in the close up detail. Um, and then on the left, there's the um, frontispiece from the next Bob and Lace sample book to be published, um, New Model Book. It was designed by a Swiss woman known only by her initials RM, who indicated that Venetians had introduced Bob and Lace to Switzerland in 1536. And unlike La Pompe, her patterns include the number of pairs needed to create, pairs of bobbins needed to create the pattern. Um, but both books indicate that the lace can be made in both color, presumably dyed silk, and in gold or silver thread. So linen was actually less common in this time period. Um, so who were these pattern books for? Um, as Adrian Points put it in 1591, these works belong chiefly to the gentlewomen for to pass away their time in virtuous exercises. And as you can see with pattern books like um, Isabella Catanea Parasole's Fior d'ogni virtu per le nobili e oniste matrone, pardon my atrocious Italian here, but um, essentially a lot of these were uh, uh, meant for virtuous and noble women to create um, as a pastime to create beautiful lace. So Isabella Catanea Parasole, her design pictured here is, was a Roman woman who published several books of design starting in 1595, predominantly needle lace and embroidery, although there's a few bobbin lace patterns as well. Um, and perfectly intact early pattern books are very rare because their 16th century owners would tear the pages out, um, paste them or nail them to the wall, cut them up, fold them, and use them really actively in the production of lace making. So it's, we are very lucky at the Met to have a few examples of these. All right. So as I mentioned, early bobbin lace was often made in gold, silver, and colorful silk threads, as you can see here. If you look closely um, at this portrait on the left, this um, Swedish princess has gold edging and embroidery around her handkerchief as well. Um, and so this sort of contradicts the image that I think many people have of lace being white, but really it was made in many colors and materials from an early period, including occasionally human hair. 
So um, really a wide variety of techniques um, were used. And it, in, during this early period, bobbin lace was actually sold by weight because the materials themselves, the gold and the silver and the, the colorful silk were more expensive than the process of making them. And I can actually specifically speak to that having recently made a gold metallic edging um, for a handkerchief project that I will talk about shortly. Um, and it only took me about five minutes per repeat of the little pointed motif, which is astronomically faster than any of the later designs that I've worked on. So certainly would have been um, costly due to the gold metal, but not due to the making, which is the inverse of later lace making. So as I mentioned, um, I won't be discussing much of my own work in this talk because I have so much that I wanna share, but I did include a recent reproduction, as I mentioned that I did for a historical research project called Refashioning the Renaissance out of Aalto University in Finland, in which I reproduced several lace edgings, including this polychrome silk and lace bobbin lace from the Metz collection. So I'm going to quickly go to a little video and talk you through the process. Hopefully this doesn't take too long to load. But essentially I started with the original um, and I drew the pattern out um, manually. Um, um, to create the repeating design. And this would have been typical. I mean, they didn't have photocopiers, of course. So um, there's a lot of irregularity in early lace patterns because people were hand drawing the pricking as we call it before they made the lace. So here I'm winding my bobbins in different pairs. And there was a lot of skill that was needed even when using pattern books. Um, they didn't have a lot of information about what stitches to use. So lace making was really open to interpretation. Different lace makers might do different repeats in different ways. Um, they might choose to do different things. So here I am working through it. And what I really enjoyed about this project, um, project especially is I already knew that I enjoyed making lace um, as a meditative practice and um, you know, the pleasure of making lace is so wonderful. But the additional thing that is important to me as a historian as well is that um, when I'm working at my lace pillow on a project like this, I'm literally embodying the movements of all the lace makers that came before me. And it helps me to understand their experiences. Um, and in this particular instance, I actually built the pillow that I'm using as well, which I stuffed with straw and it's a cylindrical pillow. And that would have been a traditional in practice as well. So I'm working through my pattern. I believe this took me about 20 minutes per repeat, um, which would mean that a lace maker could have produced more professionally, more quickly than I could about a meter a day, which is very fast for lace. Okay, let's go back. All right, so that's a little example of um, the process of making lace. So one of the most notorious lace accessories in history, of course, are giant lace ruffs. And they looked just as bizarre as um, to people in the contemporary period in the 16th and 17th century as they do to us today. Um, and in fact, the 16th century English pamphleteer, Philip Stubbs condemned ruffs as quote, clogged with gold, silver, or silk lace of stately price, wrought all over with the sun, the moon, the stars, and many other antiquities strange to behold. And he even said that rough wearers tricked up these cartwheels of the devil's chariot of pride, leading the direct way to the dungeon of hell. So really these criticisms of fashion people as being frivolous go back a very long way. Um, so, however, the structure of these was actually quite ingenious because this, the lace itself was made in a long strip, which could then be goffered or pleated into different design organizations, which is what you see in this, you know, rude caricature of a lace goffering shop or a linen laundresses shop on the right here. But it did allow you to change the design frequently, so it wasn't permanently set in a rough shape. Um, and additionally, you could use different colored starches. So yellow was very popular, also pink and blue, although in portraiture, you mostly see white. So despite the outcry, by the 17th century, the fashion for lace was in full swing and men and women alike could not get enough of it. Sumptuary legislation across Western Europe tried and failed to keep lace out of the hands of the increasingly wealthy merchant class. And there are records of lace wider than the allotted length um, for a certain individual's class 
being chopped off of the wear in public if they violated the sumptuary legislation. But try as the government might, lace was obtained by any means necessary from smuggling in coffins to outright theft. Um, and in 1613, the young John Carlton was described by John Chamberlain, a friend of the family, to his uncle, Sir Dudley, in a letter about his extravagant laces. Quote, I cannot write you much of his courses because I have not done, I have not much of his company, but I see him very fine and neat, or rather curious, especially cut work bands, which is what we're looking at here, wherein our youth are become so vain that an ordinary band with double cuffs costs six or seven pounds and some more. And upon speech of this and the like, his father told me that he had a hundred pounds worth of such wear. So people were spending enormous amounts of money on collars like this, which is a standing band. So it's hard to tell whether fashionable consumers drove the rapid changes in lace designs or if it was the innovation of the lace makers, much like um, trends sort of um, come from different directions today. The answer is probably both. So Belgian bobbin lace had risen to the top of this sort of Western European lace industry as the some of the finest and most ethereal lace that money could buy, thanks in great part to the incredible skill of the Flemish thread spinners. So um, 17th and 18th century Flemish linen thread could be spun as fine as size 1200, with the average sewing machine thread today running about a size 80 for reference. Um, and I'm, in, I'm sure I'm cre preaching to the choir when I say that industrialization did not in fact improve the quality of textile production as is often assumed, but only the quantity. And in fact, flax production today, um, flax plants have been decimated by industrial processing over the past two centuries. And today the finest linen thread spun by machines can only be made at about a size 180. And even that is very difficult to get. So, Needle lace reached its pinnacle, perhaps in the Baroque period of Venetian grow point, a three-dimensional needle lace often described as carved from ivory. In fact, Renard Car renowned carver Grinling Gibbons carved a very realistic wooden grow point lace cravat out of wood that you see here, um, and it really resembles the original. Um, and lace historian Pat Earnshaw has examined the stitching of grow point needle lace and calculated that it is constructed of up to 6,000 stitches per square inch, so incredibly labor intensive. Over the decades, regions that specialized in bobbin versus needle lace remained in stiff competition as different styles went in and out of fashion. After the Baroque grow point period needle lace, the, the Baroque grow point needle lace went out of fashion, the Venetian lace industry never really recovered. Um, and Belgium and France emerged as leaders of the lace industry. Um, in fact, under Louis XIV, French, French lace re reached its climax of perfection and beauty. Um, and Colbert imported, Colbert, his cultural minister, imported um, lace makers from Venice and as well as designers to set up um, new schools and in lace industries, some of which still exist today in France. And he threatened with the death penalty those who might attempt to carry lace secrets beyond the French borders. So far, I've focused primarily on the wearers and designers of lace, as is most common in lace history and is necessary to sort of set up the story the stories that I'd like to share with you. Um, but what about the makers of these beautiful objects? Who were the women producing these ex exquisite works of thread? According to Santina Levy, the few records surviving from the 16th and 17th century suggest that the Venetian lace industry was always closely linked to the convents and their wealthy patrons. But in Flanders or Belgium, although the convents played a part, the industry was more complex. Lace making was an abundant source of na national wealth to Belgium and only and 150,000 women or a quarter of the population are recorded as working as lace makers in 1861. Um, there are not many earlier records, but the number would have been much higher um, in previous centuries. But only a small number worked in ateliers or schools, the majority worked at home. Lace making fit well into the developing capitalist society and along with an influx of wealth from the colonies only helped to widen the gap between rich and poor. Even when lace makers were organized into schools and workshops, they were barred from creating guilds or joining, or joining male dominated guilds of embroiderers and weavers. This meant that they had no power to negotiate their pay, which was set by the middlemen or lace merchants who reaped the bulk of the profit of their labor. So how much did lace cost and how long did it take? 
Um, you may have noticed that so far I've only showed lace accessories and no full lace garments. And that is because very, very few exist prior to the 19th century. One of the rare examples, which only exists in portraits, is this um, Brussels lace gown that was made for Maria Theresa of Austria. And it was actually made for her to pay a government debt that Ghent, Belgium owed to the Habsburg Empire. And it took approximately 50 lace makers six months to complete for a modern day value of around $750,000. Unfortunately, it's been dis dispersed. So I think there are pieces of it in different collections, but the dress itself was not kept together. So in her book, Bobbins of Belgium in the 19th century, Charlotte Kellogg described a student named Colette who worked for one year on a two and a half yard long Juan de Perry's bobbin lace scarf at 16 years old using a thousand bobbins and was paid 50 cents per day. The value of lace really cannot be overstated. And it's shocking to me that more economic historians have not focused on the lace industry when it was the largest export industry in Belgium and enormously expensive and desirable. But of course it was a domestic cottage industry dominated by women. So we're not really surprised, are we? So despite the obvious hardship, lace makers also had a great sense of community and filled their long days with songs and lace tells or chants that were repeated to the rhythm of their lace making. Um, so tells were chanted rather than sung and counted along with each pin. Counting songs were used in games that pitted one group of pupils against one another to see who placed the mo most pins in an allotted time. Um, and they would include information also about, you know, when, how long they worked and their different feast days and things like that. So they're a really valuable resource for historians. On the left is a lace maker's candle block, which was used to direct the light from a single candle onto many different lace pillows. And it has been documented by David Hopkin of Oxford that one candle block could be used for up to 18 lace makers. So, and you may be familiar with the nursery rhyme, Jack jumps over the candlestick. That actually comes from a lace feast day celebration, celebration where they jumped over the candle block. Of course, we all know what was to come in the 19th century, the introduction of lace machines. And at first lace machines could only produce a plain tool netting, which lace makers would apply handmade, handmade motifs to, but quickly they caught up. And in fact, today, even the levers lace technology of the 19th century is becoming increasingly obsolete with um, designers like Chanel having to purchase their own levers lace manufacturer, Sophie Hallett in 2013. So even these machines are, are now being replaced. So we're moving to the story of lace does not end there. In fact, the introduction of lace machines was not even the first time that the handmade lace industry had endured collapse and revival. Um, and as early as the 1640s, there are stories of philanthropy, philanthropy in different lace regions around Europe and around the world. Lace had already been introduced to the Spanish colonies as far back as the 16th century as a form of cheaper labor produced in Europe. But in the 19th century, the, the bobbin lace expanded all across the globe. Um, in Brazil, of course, bobbin lace was introduced by the Portuguese. Um, and it was, you know, at first it was certainly an exploitative practice. It was seen as a civilizing technique because you're, it was a pure and virtuous lace technique that you had to keep your hands clean and things like that. But despite the exploitative introduction of lace to countries like Brazil, lace making has evolved in these regions to have a unique aesthetic and meaningful designs and has become a cherished part of local lace traditions. Um, the same goes for Southern India where lace making was tied to missionary organizations from England. Um, and there's a groundbreaking study in, from 1981 by Maria Mies called The Lace Makers of Narsapur, which I highly recommend you read. And today there are many Indian craftspeople who are still working with these lace makers in the region to um, promote these artisans that are still working, um, including the Center for, for Sustainable Design India and the artisanal showroom Marasim New York, in, um, which is in the garment district, in fact. In the Americas, the technique of Tenerife or spider lace named for the Tenerife Islands um, was introduced uh, everywhere from Puerto Rico to Paraguay, where it's known as Nyan du Tea. And of course, we have the Irish lace industry, which was introduced by England during the famine and promoted by Queen Victoria, perhaps hypocritically, um, if you're familiar with the history of the reasons for the famine. 
So I'm, I'm skimming here because I, I'm, I don't want to run out of time to introduce some phenomenal lace makers that are working today in the fashion industry. But I will just say that I'm skimming the 20th century because somehow it is the least studied century in lace history, despite being the most recent, so more to come. But there was lots of innovation that happened during this time period. So now we're jumping to the modern day to look at how lace is still being used in innovative ways in the fashion industry. And one of the designers who's been using handmade bobbin lace in her, tech, in her designs for the longest time is Ulyana Sergen Sergenko, a Russian couturier. She's been using lace for many years in her collection, particularly from Vologda, which is a very well-known and established bobbin lace region. Um, then this past year, we had the Fendi hand-to-hand -hand project, um, wherein they worked with um, lace makers both in tatting and bobbin lace regions of Italy to create limited edition runs of their signature baguette handbags. And then we had the Dior Cruise Show in 2021, where Marisa Grazia Chiuri um, co collaborated with Italian ar artisans to create bobbin lace for the collection. So, but what about, these are obviously, you know, couture level designers that are not available, accessible to the average person. And that perhaps is just the very nature of lace. But I wanted to quickly introduce you to a few younger designers who are approaching lace making in a really different and new way in their fashion designs. So first we have Alexandra Sipa, who is a recent graduate of Central St. Martin's, and she created her um, thesis collection and subsequent collections using discarded electrical wires, so a totally sustainable practice in lace making. And she was taught to make bobbin lace by her own Romanian grand grandmother, who um, taught her to make lace and then helped her with the collection. And she even taught her own boyfriend so that she could finish her collection on time. It's a wonderful story. Um, you can find more information about her online. And she's since done collaborations with um, storied houses like Maison Margiela, as you can see on the bottom right. So more from her, hopefully, in the future. We also have Ana Andrade, who is a Brazilian designer and um, who works with lace makers from her community. She communicates with them via WeChat. So they discuss different sample techniques that they want to work on. Um, and she has recently also begun working with artisans working with straw techniques in Brazil as well as with incarcerated women in Brazil to create these beautiful crocheted garments with leaves that you can see in the bottom here. Um, and she's really dedicated to ethical labor practice and um, giving women you know, a, a real valuable source of income. So we also have Cara Quinteros who created a zero waste bobbin lace collection out of um, local yarn that can be completely handmade to shape. Each pattern is made just to the shape so there's no waste and then it can actually be composted at the end of its life. Um, and finally, we have Kerr New York designed by Kasuni Rathnasuria, who is a Sri Lankan woman who works with Sri Lankan Biralu lace makers um, to create full garments out of bobbin lace. And in fact, I'm wearing one of her blouses today. Um, and what's interesting about Kasuni's approach is that she doesn't have the lace makers change anything that they're doing. So she doesn't give them different designs. She actually takes the designs that are already, that they already traditionally make and reincorporates them into new techniques. So she mostly uses strips of lace um, and then sews them together to make larger pieces of fabric to make garments. She also makes sure to let the lace makers set their own price and never negotiate with them. And she is actually a member of Brooklyn Lace Guild, as is Kara. Um, so the, there are some, just a few of the very exciting um, young fashion designers that are working with lace today. All right. So what's different about these fashion projects than the historical lace industry? They center and empower the lace makers themselves. Unlike in history, today many lace makers have the privilege to enjoy making lace as a hobby to relax and create beautiful things for our own pleasure. But we cannot forget that it is still an income gener generating industry for women in many communities. It is our responsibility to ensure that not only do artisanal crafts like lace making continue to flourish in the art world, but that current and future generations of professional working lace makers are paid fairly and that their stories and identities are not lost to time. 
I have a hard time with conclusions because there's no real end to the story of lace. Um, there are only more beginnings, but I want to leave you with a story of, of hope um, and the hope that I feel for the lace and craft communities, despite the incredible hardship of the last year and a half, the silver lining has been that the notoriously inaccessible and technology phobic lace community has entered the virtual world in an incredible way and transformed the field. So now anyone with a computer and Wi-Fi can learn to make lace from teachers around the globe and virtual lace events happen so often that I honestly can't keep up. Um, so I will leave by saying, let's continue this good work together. There are lace makers in communities around the globe who would love to work with fashion designers and ateliers um, in New York and in Europe and everywhere. And the young designers I mentioned could all benefit from promotion and most importantly, support through buying their designs. So making lace is painstaking by hand and may seem to be anachronistic in our fast paced digital world, but now more than ever, I believe that we have so much more to learn from it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ellen. That was really, really inspiring. And you got so much information in there. So really thank you, because I know that's hard work. Um, super inspiring. I'm, I'm thrilled to see all these young designers that you mentioned. So thank you for doing that. I'm sure it will be very inspiring to some of the students who are joining us today. And if anybody wants to connect with Brooklyn Lace Guild, there is an Instagram called Brooklyn Lace Guild. So I'm sure you can find out more, or maybe they have a website. And if you're interested in Eleanor's work, her Instagram is Erina Naomi, but it's with an R, not an L. So make sure you see it on our website in order to spell it properly. Oh, it's there on the screen. Yes, yeah. it's my Japanese nickname. So it, yeah. it's a little confusing, but- um, I thought it was the I've Japanese a pronunciation <laughs> of an L. So. Thank you so much. No, thank you for sharing all this amazing knowledge that you've gathered. It's really a, a life PhD. Thank you.